Welcome back to the Headbangers Book Club. We are finally... Oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Zach. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kelly. <laughs> we are finally coming back to do the second part of I'm With the Band by Pamela DeBar. And it's going to be an interesting episode because I read the book i finished reading the book probably like a month ago I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing where you finish it on time and i'm just like well i don't feel like reading this right it's our classic <laughs> it's our classic dynamic and so we're gonna do this um we're gonna do this kind of meatloaf style where uh because i also switched to audiobook for the second half so oh, I, I don't really have a way to easily go back and review <laughs> what I've read because <laughs> my original audiobook? it's good it's not quite Sebastian Bach level in both a good way and a bad way it's more polished than Sebastian Bach's so yeah. <laughs> you know and that's the reason why in both a good way and a bad way um and it's not even really a bad way it's just in a like it's it's not as hilarious as Sebastian Bach's because yeah. it's actually something <laughs> that you can imagine somebody who's not like a hardcore Skid Row fan or uh, somebody who podcasts about rock biographies that you can actually imagine someone listening to it, like, you know, wanting. She has a, a much more pleasant voice than, than yeah. Sebastian Bach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, she, you know, she does podcasts, right? She has a podcast. Oh, nice. I'll have to yeah, check that out. She, Yeah, I, I subscribe to it. But like most things, I will bookmark things and right. leave tabs up and subscribe to things and then never actually watch them. But what I have done is watched her YouTube channel, which I've actually really been enjoying. <laughs> I subscribe to that and um, she just kind of talks to you. I watched one actually just before we were recording where she talks about 200 motels and her experience with that. And a lot of it is like, oh, you can read about this and I'm with the band. Right. But it's just kind of like interesting that she has like a do a house tour with me type of youtube channel or like there was one where she uh, gave a tattoo tour <laughs> which i thought was very cute and um she was shows dave some navarro of her, a guest on on that un unfortunately no <laughs> unfortunately BFF, no dave navarro. yeah yeah she does not have a live moss tattoo um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and like she'll she'll uh she just, she's i watched one where she was showing some of her older clothes she showed the um the little velvet dress that she wore in the foxy lady video and yeah, I, th was... I think i remember you mentioning that and yeah that's that i, I want to see that because that that yeah, just I can, sounds I can amazing link you to them yeah she she said she doesn't have a lot of her clothes because she had to sell them over the years or whatever but right. she shows some of it and she like shows her house and she just kind of talks and it's just like very pleasant to watch. So I imagine yeah. the audiobook like would be similar to that. She also teaches writing workshops. I know, I saw that. <laughs> She's yeah. actually teaching a creative writing workshop. I found this out tonight actually because I, I was looking because I'm thinking I actually kind of want to take a writing workshop from her <laughs> so I was looking when they are and I was seeing like oh well, maybe we can take a trip out to California or something at, at some point I don't know when the hell that would be because I was thinking she only did them in California and there's one in Chicago tomorrow night and the night after oh, wow. that I didn't know about and like I wouldn't have been able to do it anyway just because too much stuff is happening this month and like I can't take time off work but right. I was like damn she's gonna be in Chicago tomorrow like so next time she's in Chicago, though, I think I might take a writing workshop from her. That would that would be that would be cool. I They're mean, not even that much. I mean, it's like one seventy, but I don't know. I've spent one seventy on way dumber things. Like, right. That's actually so, yeah. That's that's very reasonable. That's yeah. Uh, I I feel like a lot of um a lot of I'm with the band and Pamela DeBar's whole thing is just kind of like putting things out there and manifesting your dreams and i'm like well let me put this out there i want to take a writing workshop with pam DeBar. <laughs> it would be the only uh meeting of a writer from our podcast series that would not result in a restraining order against us so i i, I don't know i met it. sebastian bach <laughs> that's true that is true <laughs> yeah that is true and he doesn't yet have a restraining order against either of us so. <laughs> well I only met him for a second. Right. <laughs> and that was before we did the podcast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I um I definitely recommend it. I, I like I've been discovered I was never an audiobook person until we started doing this podcast. And what I like about it is uh because as you've probably noticed from our schedule, there are often times that both of us 
it just hit a wall and are like, I don't want to fucking read. Yeah. Uh, and so what I, <laughs> and I, I don't know why, because I actually <laughs> really enjoyed this book and it was a quick read, but I right. honestly like after we finished recording, I didn't even crack this book open <laughs> until like two days ago. And I don't know why. Right. I was playing video games. I was playing Ooblets. Ooblets came out on Switch and I've been playing that constantly. <laughs> yeah, right. I was able to finish it because I'm trying to get in the habit of taking walks almost every day. And so like if I go out and walk for half an hour, then that's often like a pretty good chunk of an audiobook. Uh, and, you know, when I'm driving and um, I can't can't listen, I'm with the band so much when my 10 year old's in the car. But uh, if I'm <laughs> driving by myself, <laughs> then it's a lot more entertaining to, uh, you know, hear about uh, Mick Jagger's oral sex technique than uh, than just to sit in a car alone. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I actually read it on the way to Columbus the other day because <laughs> we, went, we went to Columbus to go to the Hello Kitty Cafe. So I read like a big chunk of it on the three hour job to Columbus. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's a it's a good audiobook. She has a fun personality. It's fun to like feel like you're hanging out with her, which I guess leads into, you know, because we we like Pamela DeBar a lot. Uh, I guess that leads us <laughs> to our, our formal apology. <laughs> First of all, I, I, I just want to say I stand by what I said. Yeah. Because, okay, so <laughs> the, actually it was the YouTube <laughs> channel that made me feel bad about it because in the the video where she talks about the dress she gives a different version of the story than what is in the book which right. is much less racist she just says like oh he had this like powerful aura and i was like just too intimidated which like i can get that from Jimi hendrix but in my defense the way it's written in the book is that he was this big black guy and she was uh intimidated by that right. that's how it's written in the fucking book so yeah <laughs> like, i can definitely see it in terms of like Jimi hendrix definitely seems like he would be a much better lay than either of the other members of the experience and maybe if you're like you know not very experienced like is the first man you want to have sex with Jimi hendrix Probably not. Is Noel Redding a safer speed to take, you know, like for your for your first go? <laughs> a, safe, a safer <laughs> speed, but is he also someone you want to have sex with? Well, yeah, there, <laughs> there's the rub. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh yeah, so uh you know, we we said we said like uh it's 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 racist to look at the three members of the Jimmy Hendrix experience and decide to have sex with anyone other than Jimmy, which again, <laughs> we do stand by. I I'm not retracting the comment. No, no, I mean not even that. It's the way it was written specifically. Right. Like it was it wasn't until I A watched that YouTube video and B listened back and I was like, "Oh, this sounds really fucked up." Right. So like I don't want it to sound like that, but like like specifically in the context of how this book was written, it sounded racist as hell, especially <laughs> when it's like a few pages either before or after when she's talking about that racist ass song that they wrote. Right, right. So I was just putting two and two together. <laughs> right. And, and I, I, I think it's important to, to note that like, I, I don't know, I, I don't think of racism as something you are. I think it's something you do. So like I, yeah. when, when I, well, I think you can be a racist, yeah. but, I, but to be clear, I don't necessarily think that Pamela DeBar is a racist. What I do think is that in the, in this book, and like who knows, her views could have changed. There's some racist ass shit. The way she writes about Jimi Hendrix is a little weird. Right. The song they wrote for the GTOs is a little fucking racist. And right. then later she's dating this like Spanish dude, and she keeps she keeps like relating him to food, and it's it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's like so you can't be with someone of a different race without constantly like bringing up things about their culture. Right. And or like I was thinking them. about <laughs> where she was dancing, where she was working at the the dancing like oh, yeah, where also she was basically that, yes. it was like a hostess club basically. Yeah. 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 And uh, and like there was some weird stuff about the Asian guys there. Uh, I realized that th this apology is backfiring. But the point is, <laughs> I, I don't think Pamela DeBar is a bad person or a white nationalist or. Well, it's not even a, it's not even an apology. It's just clarifying, because, right. again, I stand by what I said. Like, there's some racist shit in this book. I'm not going to I'm not going to apologize for that. But also, like, I'm not saying, oh, Pamela DeBar confirmed racist. Right. You know, just cancel she's her. She's just like a white lady from the 60s. So, of course. 
course you're going to say some bullshit. Yeah, exactly. And it's also like a lot of the book is from her perspective at that time. And it's like, yeah, I mean. I mean, even even when I was a teenager, I said some things that I wouldn't say now. Certainly. Right, like, right. You know. Exactly. So I don't even think she would disagree. We love Pamela. So uh, we're not a woke mob. You know, we're just we're just calling them <laughs> like we see them. That's that's all. A woke mob. Um, <laughs> before we get into. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't think I ever finished my thought. So I finished the book early because I was reading the audiobook. Callie just finished the book. It's been a, a long ass gap between the last two times. And my initial book that I was reading was a library digital copy, which has long since expired. Uh, long story short, I don't have any way to look back at, at the book. So we're doing this meatloaf style where Callie has read it recently and I half remember everything. Uh, and and I, I will say I, I have some confidence in it working because I thought the beatloaf episode was really good and maybe yeah. actually not fucking remembering details will uh, will streamline things and, and like we'll just go talk about the important stuff um, or it might suck. I don't know. Uh, but hey, either way, you know what else? Um, this is kind of veering off. But like last time when we were talking about like if we were in the 60s and also groupies and it would be we would be in Michigan. So like who? Who would we sleep with? Right. I forgot Meatloaf was in Detroit. Oh my god! Yeah. So Meatloaf would be a contender. Right. Actually, there the like when we think about it that way, there are like a, a lot of options. Actually, honestly, I would have Scott Scott Ashton in his prime was kind of a babe. Yeah, he was a well, hunk. And, I mean, Iggy, obviously. I thought Rain Kramer used to be pretty sick. Yeah, I would make out with Wayne Honestly, Kramer. I would I would smash Meatloaf. Yeah, yeah, me, young Meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, he was uh nude a lot for for hair, so you you know you know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> yeah, there were there were a lot of there were a and lot of options. Mark, I mean Mark fucking Farner. Mark Farner. Oh, yeah, My exactly. Favorite, See, Mark we're Farner. on the same wavelength. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't we say him way sooner? <laughs> Have I already told the story about it's not even that interesting, but like there's a picture of Mark Farner on a horse and <laughs> like for my birthday, I always share that. And it's like when I say I'm a Sagittarius, this is what I mean. It's just Mark Farner shirtless on a horse. I'm pretty sure we talked about that in the Meatloaf yeah, episode, well, actually. Yeah, well, there's the story again. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy that. <laughs> um, Ta- so- talking about memes is always the... <laughs> best part of any podcast. Right, exactly. Talking about a meme that you made that no one meme. cares about. <laughs> All right. Uh, so before we get into this, before we get into this, uh, this experiment in in memory, I do have some comments uh, to to go through. I'm going to focus on. So we've gotten some good ones um, all over the place, but I'm going to obviously focus on the ones from the last Pamela DeBar episode. Um, I do want to call out. There's 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 two from old ones that I want to call out in particular. Uh, Did we get any funny ones this time? Kind of. Um, there's one I want to respond to because I want to respond to it. And there's one I can want to respond to because it's funny and, and confusing. So um, so this <laughs> this first one was for our, um, the Led Zeppelin episode. It was William, William Sherman. And he said, wow, I remember reading Hammer of the Gods when it first came out and being totally jealous of these guys, especially Jimmy Page, which, A, I think is funny because we, like, um, completely eviscerated jimmy page in this in this podcast so oh, and he he's gonna get more of it this oh yeah episode, yeah for the, sure. the second jimmy page shoe de- definitely dropped in the second half of the uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're known non-fans of jimmy page but i also wanted to say i would be curious william sherman how old you were when you remember when, when hammer of the gods first came out because if i, I think there's a very different experience reading hammer of the gods before and after 30 um. Oh, I agree. I agree because, you know, I never, I never liked, I mean, I always liked their music, but um, when I was a teenager and I read this, like, I still thought it was funny and I was like, what the fuck? They're like shitting in shoes, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if but I felt I remember jealous. Having more, I, I didn't, I definitely didn't feel jealous. I mean, it's probably a little bit different when you're a teenage girl versus a teenage boy. Right. But like, um, 
I feel like I had more fun reading it. Like, it was still long as hell, but yeah. I had more fun reading it as a teenager. <laughs> and this time, it was just a slog through hell. I hated it. I hated every second of reading that fucking book. Yeah, reading Hammer of the Gods or any Led Zeppelin book or, or any or any rock book over the age of 30 uh, <laughs> is, is an exhausting experience, which is why we, we can't, we often can't do these two weeks <laughs> every two weeks because we, we need to, like, take a fucking nap after we read the first half. <laughs> Well, to, be, to be clear, I actually like Pamela DeVar's book is easy to read and fun to read. I just didn't want to fucking read because I was playing Ooblets. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah, it's that's that's true. This was not this is, this is just a buried ad for the game Ooblets on Nintendo <laughs> yes, Switch. It's all this is all just elaborate uh, viral marketing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I, I think it's it, it also influences what member of uh, Led Zeppelin you identify with, because um, definitely was more in the John Paul Jones camp than I've than I've ever been. <laughs> like, I, I think John Paul Jones is pretty boring, but in Led Zeppelin, boredom being boring is a virtue. Like, it's it's such a breath of fresh air <laughs> compared to those yeah. other idiots. Or, or like, because I think Jimmy Page is kind of boring, too. You know, he's he's like boring in the way of like a guy who has like a really obnoxious affectation. Like, oh, yeah. Tell me more about Aleister Crowley. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. like that's fucking boring in like a different way. <laughs> There's other off topic comment I wanted to address it was not on a headbangers book club video, but this is also the only podcast we've been recording. So I I'm, I'm choosing to respond to all of our content. And this also lets me talk about some videos that I used to make that I don't anymore because a, I don't travel that much anymore. And B, I don't know, like people didn't really seem to be into them. So I used to make these videos of like record store tours, uh, like actual videos and I did one for Lucky Records in Reykjavik, Iceland, which was probably the most interesting one I've done just because it was in Iceland. And this was like, when did I go to Iceland? I think like 2016. So this was maybe late 2016, early, early 2017. It's literally years old, like five, six years old. And um, I got a comment on it six days ago from a user, a YouTube user called AO. And it is just an angry face emoji. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know why he's angry. I don't know if it's, if he's the owner of a rival Reykjavik record store and he's upset that I am giving Lucky Records free publicity or if he's mad at me for some other uh, transgression I've done against him and is just scowling. He came across another one of my videos and is scowling at me in the comments I, I don't know. Uh, there are there are no clues. Just this angry face emoji. What is up with people finding our stuff from like eight years ago? And yes, that, the, the dude I is... talked about in the last video that was like kept commenting on my shit. Oh right. He he sent me a weird. I did not listen to it because it scared me. <laughs> right. But he sent me a weird voice message at like 10 p.m. <laughs> and I was just like, um, I'm gonna block you now because what the fuck is this? Yeah. That is weird. And this and this was like a month or two after the whole thing where he was commenting on my photo went down. So it was like two months later and you're still I don't know, upset, I guess, and that he sends me a voice. It was like 10 p.m. on a Sunday. Yeah. It's weird. It is weird. And I was also going to say this is a, very a, much... A angry face is also sinister, though. It is, <laughs> yeah. And and this is uh, very much in the tradition of the comment we talked about last time from the Mark Boland book where the guy, Roy Ferguson, just said BS. <laughs> 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 With Apropos of nothing. No, he does not explain it any further. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we keep getting these weird cryptic, uh, comments and luckily neither of us care what anybody on the internet thinks. So, um, <laughs> and now a few from our last episode, um, I want to say thank you to Pamela DeBar for retweeting us a couple of times. I think, I feel like we got some, some attention from that. Uh, so that's a, that's Pamela DeBar one, Sebastian Bach one, Morris Day zero, uh, <laughs> oh, also, Meat Loaf Zero, was, but in his defense, he's, he's I mean, dead. <laughs> he's retweeting us in spirit. Yeah. Um, uh, it was Pamela DeVar's birthday on the 14th. 
of this month of September. Oh, that's right. And I was sad that I didn't get my shit together. I know. So I was like, this would have been a great time to, to launch our second podcast. We could have yeah, really no, timed this. Yeah. No, made it look. Not, yeah. not even a little bit, but happy birthday, Pam. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for retweeting us. So I feel like we, we got some new, some new listeners, um, which probably came from, from that, I would imagine. So this is one free country is the YouTube account said such a good choice. Nicely done. So thank you. Jukebox Cowboy said he's looking forward to part two. Uh, <laughs> thanks for looking forward. Uh, it's finally here. Our friend Jay May said, love this. I know the GTO's album is not great, but I love it. And Pamela has great stories. P.S. I was around for Buttgate, which I... <laughs> what is that? <laughs> oh, is that the hemorrhoids? I don't remember because it feels like we talk about butts a lot. I know. It, uh, yeah, I was like, is that the hemorrhoid thing? You're going to have to narrow it down. Oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was. You know, because if, <laughs> if if anybody listens to, has been around for long enough to listen to the hemorrhoid episode, I, I think, or or um, again, for, for those who missed it, anal fissures, the, I should actually... <laughs> I was just, I was just in our studio. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm digressing again. Uh, I was just in our studio section on YouTube and there's like, you know, analytics about click through rates and, and stuff like that. And I saw that our average length of a listen when somebody clicks is like 12 minutes long. And I should l listen to that episode again and find out exactly how far into the video I say anal fissures and see how many people <laughs> drop out at that point. <laughs> and that might encourage me to not talk about my anal fissures until the end of the podcast in, fu well, in future episodes. Too late now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but next time. Um, so, yeah, I feel like if anybody was listening back that far, uh, Jay May would have been one of them. So, um, that makes sense. That feels, I, I feel great knowing that he's known about my butt problems for four years. This, this complete <laughs> he's stranger. He's still a listener. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It makes me, it makes me feel, um, you know, not disgusting. Like, so that's, that's always that's a nice feeling. Um, so yeah, those are, the, we got more comments, but, um, I'm not very focused, so let's let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> We're all, we've already burned enough time on this, uh, but thank you, of course, for listening. You know, I love it when you guys interact with us, and um, if you keep if you keep commenting, we will uh, we'll we'll try and read them. Smash uh, that like exactly, button. Exactly, exactly. Hit the bell to subscribe. <laughs> I'm with the band. Um, let me open up my table of contents and see if something can jog my memory. If I recall, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were so hold on. Let me go back to we were on chapter six. Oh, yeah. Chapter. Yeah. It's a gas, gas, gas. That was the that was the first episode. Yeah. We read. This is this is jogging my memory because everyone is like a man that is kind of the main theme of, of, of the chapter. So this was like I thought of this as the Mick Jagger chapter. And this was interesting because I don't think we really talked about this. But Mick Jagger did show up. I mean, we, we talked about her whole thing about starting out as a Beatles fan and then becoming, you know, becoming a woman. So now she's a Rolling Stones fan um, and uh, and the like schism that created in her friendship. But I don't think we talked about the fact that she actually met Mick Jagger in the first uh, episode, in the first half of the book. Yeah, like briefly, he yeah. kind of just kind of tells her to go home or whatever because she's kind of stalking him right she shows up at her bungalow which is a theme by the way again i want to preface this by saying that we genuinely <laughs> we genuinely like family devar even though we called her a racist and also um kind of called her a pedophile in the last episode okay uh, but she was writing a creepy song about kids <laughs> Right. In our defense, these are not these are not completely unprovoked <laughs> attacks on our character. Uh, but, you know, we genuinely like her. But there is a I mean, there there's a point at which like where is the line between groupie and, and, and stalker? Right. Like it's 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 a fine one. I mean, well, later on in this episode we'll talk about her the Marlon Brando. relationship oh with God. Marlon Brando which was full on stalking I'm sorry it was, it was. <laughs> yeah can you if it was a, basically if it was a man um, it would be uh, incredibly like Marlon Brando would have uh, called the cops um, 
<laughs> so yeah, she shows up at uh, the bungalow where the stones, I think all of the stones are, were staying in like bungalows in LA. And Mick is like, uh, he sees her through the window and he's kind of like, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So this I think is, he's like, go home, pretty girl, or something right. like that. And she's excited that he called her pretty girl. Right, right, exactly. Because he was probably, he could probably tell that she was too young. And, he, and he's not Jimmy Page. Yeah, in a, in a, in a rare for these books uh, sign of restraint, he, he sent her home. <laughs> but now she's, you know... An adult and sort and like running in the same circles, no longer just showing up unannounced at Jimmy P- at, at uh, Mick Jagger's bungalow. So now he is a sort of a, a legitimate perspective conquest for her. And she's also this is like who was the man she was on the out? Was it still fucking Chris I Hillman? Think- no, it was Jimmy Page. Oh, it was Jimmy. She was That's dating right. Jimmy Page. That's right. Which is like I'm sorry. Doesn't matter how serious I'm about Jimmy Page. If I'm with Jimmy Page and Mick Jagger. Wants to have sex? I'm jumping shit so I mean, fucking fast. Yeah, like 1971. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, like, not even what? 71, even, Mick. Even 69, now. Mick. It even was... now. <laughs> even, even now, would you rather fuck Jimmy Page now or Mick Jagger now? The answer is clear. <laughs> Yeah. And I've already, we've already mentioned in the last episode how funny it is that like Mick Jagger was so sexy at, in the like late 60s and now he's just like kind of goofy dad and he's still sexy. He's still than sexier Jimmy than Jimmy Page like by a lot. Uh yeah. Uh there's <laughs> Cuz last time we left it as they we were saying, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Jimmy Page doesn't seem like a complete sack of shit. And well, we we were mildly surprised by that. But we also knew that, you know. Well, yeah, we read the book. We right. know what happened. Yeah, we knew what was going to happen. And so um, sure enough, he um, basically ghosts her pretty much. I mean, there's some there's a little bit of like he like sends her a fuck. He sends her some or she sends him a, some Alistair Crawley shit. Yeah, he, you know, asks, he asks her to go look for this stuff and she finds something. And so he sends her something back. Yeah, like a, like right. A, Jewelry, and they have, and for a while they do the thing where he's like, um, you know, oh, I'm in LA, I'll, I'll come see you. But then it, it's, it's like to the point where, you know, he's coming back and she knows he's coming back, and then he won't call. Yeah, he's and, a fuck boy. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, here's, you know, Jimmy's like doing this weird keeping her at arm's length fuck boy thing. Well, because he's too busy fucking fourteen year olds. Right, exactly. And Mick is there and he's interested and he is again objectively sexier than, than Jimmy Page. At at any point. He, even at even at peak page. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she, you know, tells Jimmy Page to fuck off and goes with Mick Jagger as any right thinking person would. But it takes a little bit because at first she's kind of not doing anything with Mick serious because she's trying to be faithful. To, to be, to yeah, Jimmy. which is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Jimmy Page is having John Bonham shit in all his girlfriend's shoes. Right. <laughs> Provoking. You should be so lucky that you didn't have your shoe shitted in. Like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she uh, she's honestly she gives him too many chances. And that's that actually kind of brings up something. So last time we were talking about. So, uh, you know, I just said there's a fine line between groupie and stalker. And last time we also talked about how there's a fine line between groupie and just like modern dating. Like, um, you know, the uh, the scandal of like, oh, my God, a, a young single woman who sleeps with uh, multiple rock stars, you know, that that the the like what she was talking about in the introduction of like doing the talk show tours and people being so horrified that, you know, you're out there sleeping with men like a, like a man, (laughs) you know? Uh, And I feel like nowadays it doesn't really read that way. It's, it's not like, Oh, she was so promiscuous. I'm honestly reading it. And I'm like, man, she's got a pretty low body count, like compared to, you know, just your average person nowadays well, yeah i mean like even like uh, a lot of this book just reminds me of me in my early to mid 20s where i was just like dating and sleeping with a whole bunch of emotionally unavailable men it's right. just like it, it wasn't jimmy page right <laughs> it was just it's, yeah. some shithead from detroit <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and so this remind like it reminded me more than anything of like, because again, I'm old. Um, and so I was reminded of Insecure on HBO, 
where it's like young people just making terrible decisions. And I'm just like sitting there watching, <laughs> watching it unfold. Uh, and that's a very stressful show for me to watch. Um, I actually, I don't think I ever finished it. I was watching it with my fiance and then I was like, you know what? I'm good. I, I don't need to, I don't, I don't, I don't need to be caught in the tangle of these young people's lives anymore. <laughs> so yeah, it gave me that, it, it, it gave me that feeling. It was, it's like some, there's some, like watching a train wreck uh, in, in slow motion sometimes, but also yeah. relatable, you know. I, and, and also, like you, I mean, like she's smart and it, it, like making dumb decisions. But again, like who among us? And right. like, and she ultimately makes the right decision. And she always so comes out can, of it. Yeah, it's it's honestly it's it's always the the men who come out of these things looking shitty. Like yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you could argue that it's her perspective, so of course that's the case. But like, we know Jimmy Page, we read right. Jimmy Page's book. He was like, <laughs> like all these guys, uh, um, and and like some of them didn't come off looking sh- like Mick Jagger. You can kind of tell who treated her okay yeah. because you know she's honest about everyone. Like, um, I think the last time she sees Mick Jagger, he's like trying to get her to have a threesome or whatever and she just says no or whatever but like he, he's still like I, I was watching her youtube vi- uh, videos and she said that they're still friends so like right. that's kind of nice you know and then it, it actually turned out in fact i remember that part and it actually turned out she thought he was trying to get her to have a free threesome and it turned out he wasn't <laughs> like oh, she found out I from, from the other woman that was there she was like oh no i was i was going home like mick was oh. trying to get you into bed which you know is all like <laughs> it doesn't it, it's not like oh how romantic he was just trying to fuck her but it's she felt like it was going in this sleazy direction that it that it wasn't necessarily yeah. and i'm inclined to believe it too because we know from from other stories that Mick Jagger was kind of a dickhead. Like, you know, he didn't acknowledge his his daughter uh, yeah. for decades. Not an unusual dickhead, like a dickhead in the way that every male rock star in the 70s was a dickhead. So it's like when I read her account and I'm like, oh, actually, here he is, you know, kind of being a nice guy. And, he, you know, like understanding the parameters of their relationship. Like, I don't think Mick Jagger was going to propose to her or anything, but right. you know, but at the, but at the time she was aware of that too. Like, right. you know, and compared to Jimmy page, you like fucking strang her along and then was like, Oh, by the way, I'm married. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he comes across looking or incredible. Jimmy page wasn't married. He was just dating other people people right well he, he, he later- got married yeah th- th- that was kind of like when he finally cut it off he was like oh we haven't talked in six months i'm marrying this other woman oh yeah okay yeah, yeah, scarlet yeah. uh or no charlotte. was it Scar- charlotte scarlet was the daughter jimmy page isn't that much of an asshole <laughs> <laughs> my first note in this chapter this is a little bit unrelated but was, my first note of this new reading is i just highlighted the word swank pot rod stewart <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I remember that. Because I guess him and uh, Ron Wood wanted to crash on her floor. And he sent her a letter. I don't even remember what happens with this. I think, like, mm. yeah, she I just calls him a swing pod. Right. I, I don't know funny. if it necessarily goes anywhere. I, I, it's so, it's very cute to me that Ron Wood and Rod Stewart were like an, an item. Like, they were a package deal. Like, yeah. you need to house both of us. <laughs> don't ever talk to me and my son ever again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I need to make that. It'll be yeah. uh, what a, <laughs> It'll be my one, series of Rod Stewart that memes. Just explain the no- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know what though? We talked about this a little bit before, but there are all those those pages that are just like I found like a Robert Plant meme page, just like a Beatles meme pages. We could start a Rod Stewart. We need Stewart to see if page. there's a Rod Stewart well, meme page and if there is. Oh my is god, it. I, if they have all of the sailor jokes that we've been telling for years, <laughs> I will kind of be upset, honestly. I don't even know how to search for this. Yeah, if anybody knows of any good Rod Stewart meme accounts, uh, let us know. <laughs> and if there isn't, if there's a market for it, I mean, then come on. Yeah, there. The, I think we found our calling because I, I actually get a lot of Rod Stewart. I mean, Let's quantify this. I don't really do. I, it's not like I make a lot of like get a lot of meme ideas. I'm kind of like I'm 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 of the oldest 
they, I think you're legally allowed to know what a what a meme is. And my brain, my old brain doesn't really work that way. But when I do want to make a meme, there is a, I would say 66% of the time, it's it's Rod Stewart. Uh, so. I think that's my problem is that whenever I think of a funny meme, it's like, oh, Mark Farner on a horse or something. But, but then I think that and I'm like, oh, nobody likes these memes. And then I find one of those fucking Beatles meme pages and they have like thousands of likes. And I'm like, what the exactly, fuck? Exactly. Clearly I'm like missing my calling. Here. Right. It's that, yeah, the, this Gen Z boomer Venn diagram that we need to tap into. Uh, and in our case, they also need to know the urban legend about Rod Stewart sucking off a ton of sailors <laughs> <laughs> because that's also going to be 90% of the content, I think. <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, yeah, the main thing that I'm remembering from this chapter is um, I already alluded to it. There was some insight on Mick Jagger's cunnilingus technique, which all I remember about it is like, it makes sense. You know, if you think about his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear anything you said because I'm still looking for this Rod Stewart <laughs> Let me focus here. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, um, like with the Mick Jagger thing, is and she met. I keep alluding to the uh, the YouTube channel because I've watched a lot of Pamela <laughs> Bar's YouTube channel. But she mentions this in the book, but she kind of expands on it in um, one of her videos where she says like Mick Jagger was kind of the one who brought Jimmy's cheating to her attention because he was just like, well, what what do you think Jimmy's doing right now? Like, oh, he's not, yeah. He's not being right. faithful. I mean, I like, you know, there might have been some ulterior motives to that because right. he wanted to sleep with her, but it's <laughs> right. still like... Yeah, he's not wrong. I think also Jimmy is deteriorating. I'm maybe not quite at this point because this, this whole storyline kind of goes through the whole 70s, but it starts getting to the point where like, you know... He comes back and now he's strung out on heroin and he comes back and now he's, you know, dressed up like an SS officer. And it's yeah, like, yeah, she mentions just, <laughs> that later. There's like a whole time. It's, it's she roast Led's up when it's yeah. so funny. The only only member, I mean, other than John Paul Jones, but really the only member who comes out looking OK is Robert Plant, which yeah. is so funny because that's like a complete 180 from Richard Cole's like <laughs> prissy <laughs> version of Robert Plant, which I never thought was the, the case because like I, I mean obviously I don't know him but he always just seems like a pretty like normal guy especially right. compared to everyone else in that fucking group I know yeah and, the, and uh, I like that he was nice to Pamela DeBars I wonder why she didn't just sleep with him because he's also hotter than Jimmy Page right like again ob like objectively he doesn't seem like he's gonna cough up blood after he orgasms yeah <laughs> <laughs> Into a little like lace uh, cravat. <laughs> um, what else happens in this chapter? I mean, <laughs> genuine, is this a genuine chapter, question. Is this a chapter where she fucks uh, Waylon Jennings? Uh, maybe. I know it ha it happens a, a couple of times. Oh, she talks about the GTO album, and we kind of talked about this before, but she um like talks about how they didn't know they were being recorded <laughs> like right. they only found out when they listened to the right. finished album and which is classic there's like zappa yeah which I, I think it's so funny that like you know she's so still so respectful of him which i mean i think that's fair i think he was a nice guy but it's just funny that i'm like okay but he was recording all without y'all's right. consent <laughs> yeah like, that is a little weird right well i guess of all the things that were happening without people's consent in uh i mean yeah late, having, late having 60s your LA, conversation recorded that, that, <laughs> like compared to the fucking what's his name the guy uh with the puppet child uh v oh, Vito. Yeah. yeah compared to Vito and his crew uh frank was like fucking norman rockwell so um <laughs> that was actually this is this is a total digression, but this ju that just jumped out to me. Um, so, like, the Zappas are a constant in both parts of the book. And even after the GTO's end, um, actually, after the GTO's end, for a while, she is the Zappas babysitter. Um, like, she just does odd jobs. And I thought it was um, kind of heartwarming, like, how normal a married couple they were and, like, how sort of normal their family was. Because, you know, I feel like most of the time the way that the Zappa's domestic life is portrayed, the, a lot of the focus is like, oh, they named their kids weird ass names. And, you know, like I saw the, I watched the Zappa documentary by Alex Winters and he was definitely having sex with a lot of other women on the road and stuff like that. So 
it was definitely not domestic bliss in the traditional sense of the word. But they also just seem to they seem to be a a comfortable home, you know, not for, for themselves and for their children and, and for people like like Pamela, who were kind of part of their extended domestic sphere. So I just thought that yeah. was kind of nice. Yeah, I think like also I I don't know the details because I haven't looked into it that much, but I think Moon's Zappa did not have a great relationship with her mom. So I don't know what the deal is with mm, that. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that's not... Um, I mean, obviously, from the outside looking in, it looks different. Right. I bet. So yeah. it's like you can't completely take Pamela Tabar's like feel about the Zappas. Like, like you said, I don't know that it was domestic bliss, but yeah, I know what you mean. Like, it, it, in general, it is kind of like just like a family. Like, you you don't think about that for any rock star, really. Right. And you know what you said trig- triggered my memory that I think in the documentary, Moon was talking about how like she did valley girl with frank because it was basically like a way to get him to pay attention to her because he was he was always just like locked up in his basement doing music so she's like uh let's do this song together i can do this impression you know so yeah again like not necessarily the family of the year but i mean when you compare it to uh, many of these books we're reading where they literally barely even know their children (laughs) yeah yeah. you know (laughs) you take what you can get and i like that gail is you know again i don't know a lot about gail's app i don't know really anything about her except from this book but i like how she's kind of like a kind of a motherly figure to Pam, even yeah. though, you know, Pam, Pam already has like a good mom who supports her and stuff, but Gail gives her a lot of advice and like, she's the babysitter for them and stuff. So it, uh, there's a couple of times where like something will happen and Pam will be talking to Gail and Gail makes her feel better about it, which right. is kind of like heartwarming, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Waylon Jennings might be in this part or he might be in another, I, I, I remember him showing up. I think she got into him through the Burrito Brothers connection oh yeah this this is where she has sex with Waylon Jennings because page 180 is when that happens yeah so yeah he he comes across like a like a pretty nice dude too all things considered (laughs) (laughs) yeah well she thinks she's having a one night stand with him and then they end up having sex in a following chapter again so she's like well no I my one night stand was scrubbed from (laughs) it's like whatever okay um this is also when she's working in that bar or whatever um and this guy he's from michigan of course but this guy from michigan like drove out there and he wanted to pay her 50 bucks to just rub her feet and she doesn't take the 50 bucks oh my god and and my note just says girl what take the money i know (laughs) i know (laughs) you got a foot rub and 50 (laughs) dollars and you're like oh i just took the 20 dollars and felt guilty guilty (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. But but you let Jimmy Page spit in your mouth for free. Or, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The second half of the book is interesting because like we got kind of the more I mean, it's never really that glamorous because like you said, it's it's a lot of the rock star liaison stories are just kind of feel like um fumbling misadventures from <laughs> someone's early 20s you know so yeah. like glamour is maybe a strong word but we got we got like the oh you know she's in this hip scene and like this nascent subculture in, in LA and all these famous people are around and blah 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 in the first half and now she's kind of like she's not even that old she's in her like mid 20s at this point yeah but she's I think sort she's of like 24 three or 24 right but she's sort of aging out of the groupie thing um because well, especially since the groupies got younger specifically in the early 70s it seems like right so. yeah it was again because they're congregating at rodney's english disco a known haven for fucking creeps yeah. so <laughs> so you know there you go like uh the, the it's gonna drive the ages down it's just I thought this part of the book was kind of funny where like Sable Star and Laurie Maddox show up and they're like just bitchy to the older yeah. groupies. So she's kind of adrift, like these relationships aren't really working out and the GTOs didn't pan out. I, I think I, I don't remember how much they get into it here or if this or if I'm mixing up my my sources. But I, I know that like who was I think it was Miss Christine and maybe one or two of the others started doing heroin. And Frank Zappa was obviously, you know, that was a, a deal breaker for him. And so he kind of lost interest because of the drugs thing. And, and just because of his, I, I guess how, 
how far do you take <laughs> the GTOs as a concept? Like how many GTOs albums are, are there going to be? So it just sort of fizzles out. I think at one point Todd Rundgren is going to take them out on tour. Uh, and yeah. then that doesn't pan out. <laughs> but shout out to Todd Rundgren for showing up again. I think we, yeah. we were just mentioning how he's he's a bit player in many of these books. Yeah, Steven Tyler does not appear in this. Shockingly, I know. Yeah. I think Steven <laughs> I, was also that... looking at younger women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that Pam ever really hit rock bottom, so it's not like she was ever in rehab. Exactly. She didn't take drugs. <laughs> exactly. so that's generally where he appears is in people's rehab stories. So. It's usually the like uh, <laughs> the turning point. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was so low that Steven Tyler was at rehab at the same time as me. <laughs> Tyler here. <laughs> So she's working at this nightclub, which is like basically like I, I mentioned it earlier. It's it's basically like a Japanese hostess bar. I guess they had those in America, too, um, where it's like it's not. I mean, it it, it kind I mean, of it is kind of sex broadly work. sex work. It yeah, is sex work. It's, it's like the lightest version sex of sex work. Yeah. So she's like dancing with men and basically just like making them feel good about themselves. Like they're mostly not the most attractive men. And this was the part that I was saying uh wasn't like fully on board with how a lot of them were asian and that seemed to be the problem with them but again yeah. you know it's the it was a different time etc cetera, etc cetera. like like sebastian bach always says yeah uh, <laughs> it was a different time <laughs> we should just um we should take a sample of that and just drop we need we need <laughs> yeah, more we need a soundboard we need more soundboard <laughs> This podcast. <laughs> Morning Zoo soundboard. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so she's she's doing that. She's, I think, eventually she starts babysitting. I, I think babysitting for the Zappas is sort of like her lifeline out of this. This yeah, shitty... she started, well, she's kind of homeless for a while too, and they gave, give her her room back, so she just right. So she kind of, in a way, does hit rock bottom, but not Steven Tyler rock bottom, yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> like Brad Whitford at best, you know. Like, <laughs> this is also, I think, this is bleeding into the next chapter because the next chapter is called "Dedicated Follower of Fashion." So I think this is about the guy. What the fuck was his name? The guy from he was from Brooklyn, but he was living in London. And he was like, w wasn't he working in, at Granny Takes a Trip or something? Yeah. Was that Marty? That sounds right, because it sounds like a New York name. I don't actually know if it was Brooklyn, but I think it was New York. And yeah, it was Marty. So this is like her first since since the other since the other guy from New York or New Jersey, that like greaser dude that she dated in the 60s. Or I guess if you count the mascara snake, I don't know. He was kind of in quasi boyfriend territory, but. I don't know if she ever named him as such. In any case, this is her first non-musician boyfriend in a while. It's her first like quote unquote normal boyfriend since she's kind of entered this scene. But he has delusions of being, uh, you know, of at least living like a rock star. So he's cheating on her all over the place and eventually you know just says like i can't tie myself down to just to just one woman so it's sort of a it's sort of a a troubled relationship eventually but i remember that she's he goes back to england and she's like saving up to come travel and see him and i think she was going to surprise him and i was like ah oh. Pam, <laughs> I don't. <Yeah. laughs> uh, and it wasn't quite as I, I thought that would be. I I I was bracing myself for she gets to London and he's you know on flagrant with another woman and it wasn't quite that, but it was kind of like I don't I don't think he expected her to show up and it was sort of cramping his style a little bit and then she ended up staying for like three weeks or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is also where there, there's two times in this chapter where Jimmy says something to her and she is fine with it or like tries to pretend she's fine with it. And then when she leaves, she collapses <laughs> to the floor and <laughs> is upset. Yeah. The second time is where he like tells him that he's uh, marrying Charlotte. And she's like, oh, he's like, are we still friends? She's like, sure. <laughs> 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 Obviously not. Like... <laughs> Yeah, that the the payoff of Jimmy Page was was pretty great because well, I mean I knew it was coming, right. but yeah, it, it, you know, I will always be one hundred percent behind someone roasting Jimmy Page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else is notable about this 
chapter. Uh, Graham Parsons gets a motorcycle accident. Oh, and that's right. Yeah, that's, and that that jogs. her dad goes to jail. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, that's right. That this was a rough period for Pam, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I forgot that that jogs the memory of like. I was talking about how Jimmy Page sort of declines, um, but Jimmy Page was a sack of shit from the beginning. I, I I think it's interesting. You can read it between the lines. You can tell that Pamela DeBar does not fuck with Keith Richards because <laughs> yeah. um, she really is very upfront about Graham Parsons decline after he bet the Stones, which is really like him and Keith Richards are the ones where that imprinted on each other and yeah. um and you know that's when graham starts doing heroin and um you know i think he was always like fairly troubled but he really takes a turn for the worse when the stones come into his life and uh, what is it like four years later he's dead um yeah yeah it's it was pretty it pretty it accelerates pretty quickly but yeah she's always talking about how he and keith are just like starting to look like each other and then what was the what, what was the other oh, oh yeah her, her dad, dad her dad goes to jail because they're like driving somewhere or they're uh they're driving somewhere and he's drinking and she keeps telling him like let me drive and he refuses and then they get pulled over and he goes to jail <laughs> <laughs> only for like a night though right um <laughs> what about Keith Moon? Is Keith Moon in the picture yet? Not yet. I think uh, they might have. Because that's 200 met Motels, already. right? Yeah, they meet during 200 Motels and then they start dating later. Yeah. Like a little bit later. Yeah, I don't remember exactly where 200 Motels falls. Into. I know it's when she's already kind of started acting. I mean, she's already trying to kind of be an actor at this point, but I think she was kind of getting more into acting so it might be around when she was dating don johnson yeah and that's that's what chapter eight is right is that was that that's i met him on a monday and my heart stood still right that's don johnson i, I, think I so. met yeah, him I think don johnson on a monday yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah don johnson i was i was excited for that and i was surprised to see that this was like this is real early don johnson like i I think like most people, when I think Don Johnson, I think Miami Vice, Heartbeat, you know, like um, his 80s when he was at his sort of commercial peak. And um, but this is the Don Johnson where he was first making Westerns, basically. Uh, what what was the movie that the Zach Zachariah? That, that was the one that they talked about, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is like real early Don Johnson, which um, makes it surprising that he's. <laughs> He's emboldened uh, to be a, as much of a shithead as he is. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he's like very controlling and um, oh, my God, the whole you, um, when uh, when he uh, lies to her and says that she gave him an STI and then it turns out that he was just trying to get her to admit oh. that she had sex with. With Mick, was it Mick Jagger? I think it might have been, yeah. Yeah, it was Mick Jagger. And then his whole thing with Melanie Griffith, which that was very interesting because they're immediately like rivals, but Melanie Griffith is a child. Yeah, I thought I was interested with that because I'm thinking I understand the jealousy, but like I feel like my first thought would be like, my boyfriend or fiance is interested in this 14 year old. Maybe I don't want to be with this man. Right. And not like, Hmm, she is barely having her period yet. Like just kind of like catty stuff like that. Right. It's like, well, right. it's a, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be with someone who's a cheating on me and B cheating on me with a child. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very 1970s dynamic. And, and I, one of the amazing things, like I do not think Don Johnson comes off in this. Well, at all and they end up becoming friends they're, they're, yeah they're 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 friends to the point that they meet dave navarro together yeah. 30 years later yeah and um oh. and like pamela and, and <laughs> melanie griffith are our lifelong friends i understand and her and melanie griffith that makes, that makes more I, sense i don't understand her and don johnson right becoming friends but i'm a much more petty hateful person than pamela <laughs> DeVars is <in> the, <laughs> <laughs> that is true I don't know if I have anything else. I th I think, like you said, the the whole uh, accusing her of giving him 
whatever it was, gonorrhea, or chlamydia, or whatever it was. He um, just, I think he just says, a, she says a social disease, and then it turns <laughs> out that he literally was lying about it because she had been to the clinic and gotten like a shot just in case. Right. Um, and he, neither of them needed treatment, and he was just making it up to get her to convince, con- right. confess. Yeah, that's probably the the worst. Uh, I guess I, I mean, technically, the worst thing he, he does is. Uh, enter a relationship with a minor but <laughs> yeah yeah enter a relationship with a minor while still in a relationship with her right yeah so it's so like the- doubly it's, it's like morally and like ethically, ethically yeah <laughs> yeah but uh the the std thing is up there and then also just like i he's he just seems like a chauvinist um so yeah, he doesn't come across great. Who's the other? She's dating another like. I think it's Keith. I think it's Keith Moon. She keeps well. She, I don't know if she's ever dating him. It seems like she just goes over to, to his house occasionally, and he is upset that he killed his roadie. Right. And they ha- they like role play. <laughs> right. The, this weird like he's a. I mean so. They meet because I guess I was trying to connect the dots because so like Don Johnson is into acting and I think that's one of the things that kind of gets her because, you know, she's interested in starting to act because she's um, in this relationship with him. And I think also just being in L.A., you're very actor adjacent in general, you know, so that's kind of one. she's like, well, I can't just make cowboy shirts my whole life, Uh, you know maybe I'll explore being an actor. And one the first opportunity she gets is obviously to her motels with Zappa, which I think I watched it fairly recently, but I think most of her parts are not in it. I think she's, I think she's, cause she was supposed to play an interviewer. Um, and her part was cut because uh, <laughs> Theodore Beichel wouldn't say fuck <laughs> or he wouldn't, or he wouldn't be in a scene where someone was saying, yeah, fuck. yeah. <laughs> So basically they couldn't film her, her scene. And I think there's a, I think like there's a huge 200 motels box set that came out a year or two ago that I've listened to on streaming. And I think there's an audio recording of her part, but not, it, it didn't make it into the, into the movie. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I mean, the movie is also like borderline unwatchable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't watched it in years. I've, I've watched it. I think I've found it somewhere and, when I was in high school. Right. I watched it then. It is on Prime Video, at least oh, last it? last I checked. So if you have, if those of you listening out there, if you have Amazon Prime Video, it is definitely worth the watch on that. It's it's very short. I think it's like an hour long because that's probably all of the usable footage they could get. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's not a better experience than just listening to the 200 Hotels album. But I think it, but it's, I like that kind of shit, so I, I I think it's a fun movie, and also it has uh, Ringo Starr um, playing. Yeah, that's that's the funniest part. That's like one of my favorite comedy tropes is having someone who kind of looks like you play you. <laughs> right, it's funny. Like when I when I was um, a teenager, me and my friend, my best friend, had this idea for a sketch that we never made, but it would be that we would have like something happening, and then we would go back in time and it would show like a reenactment. And we would be playing each other. And so <laughs> my friend has blonde hair. So I had like this crappy blonde wig and then I have curly hair. So she'd be wearing just like an Afro wig. <laughs> that's so confusing too. Like that's, that's the best thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that it's worth watching for uh, Ringo alone. And Keith Moon is also in it as he's a nun, I think. Yeah, he's either a nun or he is well, he's billed as the hot nun. And I think I think he's I mean, he's basically playing Keith Moon just like completely cratered on downers dressed up like a nun. So he's, you know, a role that's very close to his heart. Um, And so that's how they meet. And then so this was kind of interesting. I don't know if you read all of the various afterwards. So the book. The book ends or or they might have only been in the um, 
audiobook. I'm not sure, but the, at least the audiobook version ends, and then there's like a bunch of extra stuff. Yeah, like from, no, I, I read those. Yeah, a from, bit. I kind of skimmed a lot of them. I skimmed. Right. There's one part where she was in Israel, and I was like, I don't want to read this. Right, she does find <laughs> Jesus, um, but but not in the main story, just in in one of the appendices. <laughs> um, maybe in one of her future memoirs, she gets into well, she the Jesus. Well, she's always Jesus. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I think then she just wants she to go to Israel. Rediscovers Jesus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so she yeah, takes the pilgrimage. She has a tattoo of Jesus and one of Elvis that I learned from the tattoo tour. <laughs> Covering all of the bases. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I bring it up because one of the editions of the book, she was like, um, there's some stuff that I didn't talk as much about for, you know, whatever reason. I don't know what, I don't know what reason she gave for Keith Moon because it, I mean, like, what is she going to, she going to protect Keith Moon's reputation? Like, yeah. you know, um, I don't really, I don't understand why she didn't talk about this, but she and Keith Moon had more of a relationship than she let on in the initial. Oh. Cause yeah, she makes it sound like, like you said that she would just come over and um, they would dress up as a priest and nun and do these like <laughs> sexual role play scenarios. Um, he also, I think he also ends up in a Nazi. I mean, I know that Keith Moon was often in a Nazi uniform. I think he ends up in a Nazi uniform in this in this book. But I, I love and I'm and I I don't disagree either. I love that like when Jimmy Page does it, it's like oh what a dick. And then when Keith Moon does it, it's like. Uh, that's just lovable scam, Keith Moon. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, what? what Robert, like uh, the Ashton brothers, one of them actually ended up in a Nazi uniform too. Yeah, <laughs> so, I just there's a, lot of, there's a lot of overlap with uh, Nazi paraphernalia and rock stars. <laughs> yeah, I just watched. Um, I just watched Gimme Danger, and um, Ron Ashton was like, "Yeah, me and my dad just really loved World War II memorabilia," and I was like. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's. It's I mean, that's the, the same. The swastika the same thing armband is Lemmy a little too. much, but. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the same thing. With that's Lemmy what Lemmy too. says too, right? Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. like, I mean, in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 At my last job, someone came with a Motorhead shirt, and my coworker was like looking at Motorhead, and he was like, "You know anything about this band?" So I was thinking that. The logo, the like Snaggletooth logo, looked a little Nazi, and I was like, "Yeah, that's Motorhead." Right. Um, they sure cat, do like the Iron Cross. Le- yeah, my cat's <laughs> named after Lemmy. Uh, Lemmy just likes World War Two. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, he spoke, he spoke it out about it, and said like, "Oh, people say that I'm, I'm a Nazi sympathizer, but I'm far from it, or whatever." Which, I, you know, like, yeah, I don't I, know. I mean, I, I don't, don't know. I don't not believe, I, and you know, I also think that the, the but, but this is this was also the same coworker, but he's he's fun. Funny. So right. I'm not, you know, um, but this was the same coworker that we were talking about, like white nationalists now versus them. And he was like, well, at least the Nazis looked cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like they had like some good like graphic design. Right. I mean, wasn't Hugo Boss, wasn't he a Nazi tailor? Uh, um, yeah. This is one of my this is one of my Coco, hobby horses, Coco too. Chanel. Like, I, I think they could. um I, I think that yeah, I mean, contemporary like, white nationalists I, could dress much better. That's what and, I'm saying. Like I, I, you know, I'm is well documented that I hate fascism. <laughs> um, that being said, some you know, good looks. It, it, yeah, like <laughs> I, I would much rather have some like tailored uniforms and uh, interesting symbols than like just some douchebag with a bear hat or something. You know, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying, like, if it, if we if, have to have if, one, if, let's yeah. yeah. I know, exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway, but so yeah, I like Keith Moon. It's it, I guess we just let him do that and raise an eyebrow, maybe, but, but he gets yeah, away well, with it. Also, kiss. Right. That's who, true. Who That's it? true. Was it, was it Ace that was in? So he, he knocked on right. On, uh, yeah, but Gene, Gene was not. Gene was not happy about that, though. I mean, understandably, Gene was not giving him a pass. Yeah, I mean, un- understandably so. I don't think. To be fair, like, let me be clear. None of them should have a pass. Yeah, like, but I, I'm just I, saying I that that happens like, a lot in rock music. Is right. People dress up as Nazis, apparently. Yeah, I feel like knocking on the door of your bandmate who you know had is parents that lived an, through an, the an, Holocaust. Well, yeah. Is an immigrant from Israel, <laughs> right? I feel like that uh, is a little more pointed than uh, <laughs> you know Keith Moon dressing up as Colonel Clink or whatever. So uh, I, I thought that was really interesting that in her in her appendices she's like um, 
She really, of all of the men she talks about, she seems to carry a torch for Keith Moon the most, um, which is very interesting. But um, yeah, he's a mess, as as we know. Um, I think was always had some kind of undiagnosed mental illness. And then I think was he especially his drinking got really bad after he ran over. His, <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> after he ran over his uh, chauffeur because he, he also could not drive and he insisted on driving and was probably drunk and and killed his chauffeur. And now basically, I think Pamela DeBar heavily implies and, and I think it's generally it's been a long time. I, I read the book Moon a long time ago and I would not be surprised if it was like depression over that that played a significant role in his early death. So um, yeah, it's a, he's a, a, a bummer story, but they, there's some, they, they have some laughs first. Yeah. <laughs> the acting thing kind of goes on for a long time. She's so, she, yeah, she's in 200 motels, um, sort of. Oh and, yeah. Keith Moon pays for her, uh, the admission oh, yeah, or whatever her to the union, her or union or card. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that is really kind of where it takes off. Um, she's in a soap opera called search for tomorrow. I did not, I, I did not do the work of, of looking up any of these to like, see if I can find her, but maybe, maybe I'll do that. No, uh, probably not. Maybe yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that eventually on my own time. <laughs> she's in slaughter's big ripoff, which I thought was funny. I don't think I've seen slaughter's big ripoff, but, um, what a weird experience to be watching a black exploitation movie with Jim Brown <laughs> and yeah. family Bar shows up like yeah. of all the places that's probably uh, the least likely place I would have expected to see her. And then she was in Arizona slim and that was the one she writes a script with um, Don Johnson. Doesn't she, or aren't they like I working on a project together? Um, I thought for a minute that that was Arizona they were in a slim. Movie. They were in a movie together. Okay. That's what I thought, but I, I didn't see, I didn't yeah, see John I think it was Johnson. Arizona slim. Maybe he's uh, a minor Oh, no, no, no. Arizona Slim is where she meets Michael DeBar, I think. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But they were in a... I I thought she was in a... Maybe she was in a movie with Don Johnson. I do enjoy... uh, I don't fucking remember this. I read it a couple (laughs) times. I Um, I do enjoy that, like, she writes about how Don Johnson is coaching her. And, like, there's one where she says that Donnie says, I'm a good actress and all I need is more colors. Whoa. I'm really getting there. I value his creative opinion with my life. Like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> I love that that excerpt could either be completely sincere or dripping with sarcasm. Like, yeah. <laughs> depending on how one reads it. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like it was sincere. And then, right. And then its inclusion in the book now right. is sarcasm. <laughs> yeah. We mentioned this before, but one of the things I really like about this book is you get that like we were talking about earlier, the, you know, Hammer of the Gods at 18 and Hammer of the Gods at 30. You get that in one book because it's her as a full grown adult looking back at the things she wrote then and presenting them often without comment. But you can read between the lines and you you can see the the point that she's making. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't remember the specifics, but I think it was like I think Don Johnson might have been helping to make Arizona Slim because I think the guy who played Arizona Slim might have been his friend. I don't know. But anyway, that was probably her (laughs) her biggest role other than 200 motels. Um, Oh, I guess maybe the soap opera would be the biggest role. But yeah, like you said, uh, that is how she meets Michael DeBar. I can't remember who fell through. There was like they needed a scene with an English rock star. So they were like, well, we know just the person. She ends up breaking up with Don Johnson first, like because. Right. I mean, he like hits her at one point. Oh my God. Yeah, that's right. That? Yeah, that's right. I, I yeah. keep I keep having to revise the worst thing that Don Johnson does. Yeah, in the book. well, that's what I was. That's why I was mentioning that because I'm like, well, yeah, he, he also hits her. <laughs> the uh, rank the worst things that Don Johnson does in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Five things Don Johnson did rank. <laughs> Um, oh, was it the Herod experiment or Herod experiment? And that's the one that Melanie Griffith is also on and where he starts cheating on her that with sounds, it. Yeah, I that, think that might have been the movie they were together 
in. Yeah, and it was it's a while. It's a while after. I don't think she's with Don Johnson at all when she meets Michael Dubar. She's okay. just like, still acting. Okay. Oh, and this is also where she starts talking to Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah, talk she, about she, Marlon Brando. Uh, yeah. So, so what happens is like the whole he hits her, and then they kind of like he's going to be with Melanie, and so she kind of like gives up on him and kind of moves on, and she's just kind of jumping from man to man a little right. bit. Um, this is when she's with Fernando, and <laughs> just like a hairdresser, and yeah, um, it's just like a list of people she was with. Yeah, and there's this like there's this actor. Isn't he from like Middle America or something? He's like a real yeah. She's with him. All American later. kind of dude uh, that she's yeah. Kind of, so first she starts because I feel like to she Marlon sees Brando. him at the same time as Michael DeBar. But anyway, a little bit before yeah. So she's already talking to Marlon Brando at this point, which is like she gets. I think she gets his. She got his phone number from her friend Michelle, and she starts leaving. She calls it semi-pornographic slash spiritual <laughs> messages on his answering machine. Um, and she just keeps calling him and, and writing to him. And so now a lot of her, a lot of her diary entries are no longer like diary entries. They are like letters to, letters to her friends or letters to Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that um, when I read that, I was like, that is a great idea. I'm going to start writing a diary that is addressed to Marlon Brando. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then eventually she like gets into his house, right? Doesn't she start dating? Is that yeah, Fernando? She, she dates, is it his hair? No, 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 no. She dates his friend, who's also an actor, right? Also, sidebar: this is where she sees Led Zeppelin at the Whiskey Go Go, and this is where she um, sees Jimmy with uh, Lori Lightning, or right? Lori, right. Lori Maddox, which is funny because <laughs> we know how that ended up. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> This is also where she says, after a quarter century on Earth, I didn't even have my own apartment job or fiance. Yeah, relatable, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> for, for different reasons. Yeah. Because <laughs> in the 60s and 70s, you could work and actually get an apartment. Maybe not in L.A., but. Yeah, um, now yeah, now it's like, yeah, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, uh, she gives her phone number to Roman Polanski, and um, he is calling her. And she tells him that he scared the shit out of her. And he, she says he laughed like a hyena and never <laughs> called again. <laughs> um, I don't know if she says a name. She just says he, she, he's a French actor mm. who is living with Marlon Brando. or Gerard Depardieu. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's it. <laughs> she wanted to protect herself from a libel lawsuit. <laughs> Yeah. So, but yeah, so through this guy, she gets entry into Marlon Brando's house. And eventually <laughs> this insane woman keeps leaving him voicemail and oh, writing and him she letters. Sees, and, she sees long, uh, Last Tango in Paris. Yeah. And she's really into the, the butter scene, which I, <laughs> which like we now know is like basically rape. Right. FYI. Right. <laughs> right. That, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that, you know, this is coming from someone who is a straight man, but like fully recognizes the sexual charisma of a young Marlon Brando. But Marlon Brando in 1972 was not young. Um, and I would say well, she talks about this. She says she's into his like thinning hair and paunch. And... Right, right. If yeah, <laughs> if I Last mean, Tango okay. in Paris is sexy, I think it is in spite of Marlon Brando and <laughs> not because of him. Uh, <laughs> I, it's been a while since I've seen that movie, but I, I feel he looks he looks like he doesn't smell great. Like uh, just his, his character is uh, very, very unappealing. And that's before he has Maria Schneider stick her finger up his ass or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is also where Graham Parson dies. And then uh, his manager, Phil Kaufman, this is when like, you know, he takes his body out and they right. try to burn it. And then he also has this like, funeral where it's like or like a benefit where he has a whole bunch of uh Graham Parsons paraphernalia and she's like I bought all of it 
<laughs> Even though I thought the dingy event was a dismal finale for the world's most underrated country song ever. But I was like, you was buying all the stuff, though. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I can't, I can't talk shit. I would probably do the same. Wasn't it for, like, legal <laughs> expenses because he, because he stole and uh, attempted to set on fire? <laughs> My favorite part of the story is that they just, like, obviously they don't have a cremation level right, like you, flame they didn't even burn the casket <laughs> like, <what? laughs> like singe it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a that's a great story one of one of the great rock and roll stories oh um, and then th- this is when she finally gets on the phone with marlon brando after she sees last tango in paris and he uh, <laughs> he just tells her to look for her to herself for the answers right <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many times Marlon had to do that. Like how many how many insane women did he have to get on the phone with and be like, "Please leave me alone." <laughs> and is that why he became a recluse? The, answer, the answers are inside of you. Right. <laughs> My favorite Marlon Brando story is when he became I, this is it's been so long since I learned this that I don't even know what the source was or if it's true. But <laughs> the story is that when he became a recluse in like the, you know, late, I think starting in the late seventies um, and then through the end of his life, he would never leave his house and he would just have like a food delivery guy come with a bag of hamburgers and throw it <laughs> over the gate and he would pick it up on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that too is relatable, especially now we have like DoorDash and stuff. I, yeah, that's the fucking life. Like uh, yeah. just having well, somebody. The same with, like yeah, like this. This same with Prince having someone else take his phone calls and being unreachable. Right. If if I could live as a recluse and just like have people throw hamburgers at my house and not yeah. be reachable by phone, I mean that sounds like the it's a best dream. Life you could possibly have. Yeah. <laughs> All of the people I well I don't necessarily have respect from Ron Brando, but like all the people I have the most respect for are like recluses, like Kate Bush. She doesn't she barely talks to the public, right. releases music whenever she fucking feels like right. it. Right. Just cashes those Stranger Things checks and, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like when she's talking about the movie where she, um, I can't remember what the fuck it was called, the movie where she meets Michael DeBar. Well, first of all, they were going to cast Robert De Niro in it, and he didn't. He wanted to play the main person because, duh, he, right. <laughs> he didn't have time because he was filming The Godfather Two, <laughs> and they wanted him to play like a supporting role <laughs> in this fucking stupid movie. Yeah, it was and, probably uh, a smart decision. <laughs> yeah, and I like when she's she just asked Ted Danson to find downers for her. <laughs> <laughs> I love this because like we are from a different generation. So we're picturing anywhere from a sliding scale of cheers, Ted dancing. I'm, I'm specifically, to- I'm specifically Master Will dancing, man. <laughs> 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 what about uh what about Ted Danson when Whoopi Goldberg told him he could do blackface at the Oscars or whatever, or whatever that was? <laughs> I don't I honestly don't remember that. When was that? Um let me look it up. This is this is important. We need to we need to interrupt the podcast. I I just I just uh here we well, go. I like Ted just adding blackface. stuff because it's like now you have to add the skit little dancing man into the show notes. <laughs> Um, so it was at a Friars Club roast of Whoopi Goldberg and he was dating Whoopi Goldberg at the time. What? Oh my God. I forgot he was dating Whoopi Goldberg. And, uh, and, and, and he made the, uh, he made the grave rookie mistake of, uh, of, of a, of a white man who dates black woman, um, of, of letting his black girlfriend tell him that he had a, basically an N word card and he, and he, he paid the price. <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg is on one sometimes. Oh my god, I see the picture. Oh my god, I just saw the picture. I don't think I've ever actually seen this picture before. Oh, what? I don't oh, think I have. Oh my god, there are white lips. Oh. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> uh, I don't know what I was picturing. Um. <laughs> okay, when you said it, I thought that she told him he could wear blackface, and it was like a joke. I didn't realize that he wore blackface. Oh no, no, no! She told him he could, and he and he ran oh, with it. Oh no! <laughs> Oh no! What is up with? She's just like smiling. <laughs> this is weird. Whoopi Goldberg, like, I mean, I, I don't mean to judge Whoopi Goldberg, but she has like a whole thing of like racist paraphernalia, right? In her right. house, which I mean, like, she's black, so whatever. But how did poor kinda, Ted get tied up? Like, what if I, she just has like a statue of Ted Danson in blackface? <laughs> This is just her weird kink. All of this was just so she could get footage. <laughs> oh, no. And it looks like chocolate. Yeah. It looks like he just had a... I guess in he, my he like mind... He ate a Twix in reverse. It, it got around his face and not around his mouth. Right. In my... <laughs> In my mind, it was like when Billy Crystal would do blackface, you know, where it was like, was that better? Obviously still wrong, but like not full blown minstrel show. <laughs> yeah, like he's got like a coat and tail. I, I thought it would be just dark makeup. I, I don't like again. I don't know what I picture when I. Oh, no. Yeah, um, Joni Mitchell also does blackface. I just like to mention that Joni Mitchell does That's blackface. right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, I, I, I was fact. picturing more tasteful Joni Mitchell blackface than... Yeah. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, all of this is... Uh, this. Okay, so do because you, we mentioned so, the name Ted Danson, so that that was a um, like yeah, a five so minute to, derail. We have to draw up every time that they did blackface <laughs> or <laughs> Ron Tim and Eric. I guess. Um, I forgot that Peter Cetera is also in the little dancing man <laughs> sketch. I need to watch that again. I don't think. Well, I, I don't you, remember. You gotta it. put it. You gotta put it in the show yeah, notes now because I exactly. mentioned it. And also, a picture I'm not gonna Ted edit this out. Like this, this is the funniest thing I've Ted Danson and blackface is the funniest thing I've seen all day. This is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Ted Danson finds her downers. It's n- neither confirmed. Well, he, I don't think he was dating Whoopi Goldberg at the time, so he probably wasn't in blackface. No, he doesn't even succeed. It's Michael DeBar who found her downers, which is why she married him and not <laughs> that, Ted Danson. That makes sense. That makes sense. If you're going to ask somebody to find you downers and your choices are Michael DeBar and Ted Danson, I think we all know what choice we would make. <laughs> Um, I want to say, like, I I always knew Michael De like surprisingly, since as a you know I'm on record as a big fan of glam rock and just like '70s rock in general. I knew Michael DeBar was a musician, but I guess I always just assumed he wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, I started listening to them. I'm like, I'm surprised I never listened to Silverhead They're before like because this is right, completely up my alley. Like they they right just sound like alley. they it just was, sound like humble pie. I know it was like super exciting because like, I was. Oh, this is this is like glam humble pie. That's like the two like the Venn diagram of my tastes is just a circle. I know. <laughs> I came into this book and I got a good book and I also got like a couple of dope albums that I didn't know about before yeah my my apologies to mike like i have literally gone through my whole life thinking of him as mr pamela de bar <laughs> yeah <laughs> silverhead is really fucking good i don't i haven't there's another there was another one after that they were on swan song i don't know why i'm looking this up it is uh patently not important but i'm mm-hmm. looking up pictures of Lindsay Buckingham <laughs> because because I feel like Michael DeBar now and Lindsay Buckingham are like the same genre they, of yeah, they are. aging rock star yeah they 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 are <laughs> so I was looking up pictures of Lindsay Buckingham to confirm that that theory <laughs> <laughs> uh, detective, that was the that was the other band. Um, yeah, I, haven't, I didn't listen to I that haven't really yet, listened but to I, them. But I was but... listening to Silverhead this morning. I was like, how have I never listened to Silverhead? Yeah. I feel like I always like I I've heard of Silverhead. You're probably on some like glam compilation or something. I've heard so. Right. This is like discovering uh, like, a new like, band to to me. Like I because I don't really listen to new to new music. So like I don't get that many opportunities to discover a new band from the seventies. <laughs> 
from my well, decade. I also listen to so much Humble Pie, I'm always like, oh, I wish I could listen to more it's Humble more. Pie that isn't Humble Pie, and this is it. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's the main thing I have to say about Michael DeBar. She ends up, they end up getting married. Um, I well, feel she like- kinda, first of all, she kind of is dating Woody Allen at this point, too. Oh, my really God. Bizarre. I completely fucking blocked that out. Jesus yeah, Christ. Well, lucky you. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't, I can't stand him. Even in this, I'm just like, ugh. Like, yeah. I do I, not like Woody Allen. I know. I really, like, when I went to college, um, I remember watching Stardust Memories, and I don't even know if I could sit through Stardust Memories anymore. Or, like, even, even like, Annie Hall. Um, that's probably of the of the genre of Woody Allen movies that are like self-insert fanfic. <laughs> Annie <laughs> Hall is probably the least unpalatable because um, I don't know, at least Diane Keaton is cute in it or, and like, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but um, yeah, he is really insufferable. And he seems like he's insufferable in real life too. Yeah. It's, it's like, like oh, whether he yeah, fucked his cool. daughter or not. Well, we know he fucked the one daughter. Uh, <laughs> but but in a in a ideal world where he didn't fuck his daughter, right? He would still be an annoying right. piece of shit. I know. Yeah, he's he just seems like just a garbage person. Oh, Lane Caudell is the actor that she was dating. Okay, and he has a weird little chipmunk face, like Donny Osmond kind of. But she puts puts up and with it because he he gets her into Marlon Brando's house. <laughs> No, no, no! Oh. This wasn't him. This was this was the dude she was dating. Was like the all American oh, boy. Oh yeah, He's yeah. Because soap I, operas and stuff. He's an actor, right? Because I feel like there was a period where, like, it, it, at this point, it's kind of like she's deciding between him and Michael DeBar. Yeah, and she pretty much chooses. Well, it, it's for other reasons, but the way it's kind of phrased in the book, she says Lane wouldn't come near me when I had my period and Michael turned into Dracula. I just like that she, she in my mind, that means that she chose Michael DeBar because he would eat her pussy when she was on her period, which is a great reason to, yeah. to choose. <laughs> that's, that's husband material. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's also just, gen- like, if we know anything about Pamela DeBar at this point, it's that she's going to choose the low English rock star over the uh, the guy who looks like he eats cornbread, you know? Well, and not only that, but like she hung out with him and didn't really fit in and he wanted her to be a certain way. And she right. says that Michael let her be me yeah, and, and like be herself. And he liked the things about her. She, he, he liked that she dated Jimmy Page and had like this past with different rock stars right. and stuff. And I really liked that. I was like, yeah, finally she met someone who just is really happy with who she is and she doesn't have to chase him and he's kind of chasing her even though he's married at this point <laughs> right. but it's still like it's he seemed like he really likes her and wants to be around her and that hasn't really happened with anyone except for kind of Mick Jagger but this one this one seemed more like he was interested in her in a relationship kind of way yeah yeah and yeah they they get married um at the time that she wrote this book she was I think still married to him yeah and then um, one of the one of the appendices she's like well we're separated yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the I, I i love those because it's like there's a time lapse and then it's five years later <laughs> whatever man she's with at the end of the of the last one it's like it fades in and she's like well we're just good friends now <laughs> you yeah. know kind of a, but i like that she can i like that she can do that and i even they i mean again like knowing absolutely nothing about their lives beyond literally the words on the pages that I read from her description. They seem like a good divorce couple. Like they like, it seemed like about as good a situation as it could be. And they just decided they didn't want to be married to each other anymore, but they, you know, had these kids together and they're still friends. Uh, Like I, I've, I thought it was a heartwarming way for the book to end. Even yeah, I, I read a recent, it was like from a few years ago, but I read a recent interview with Michael DeBar and he still just like speaks highly of her. So it's like, yeah, so it was kind of, and, and, and like, even though the marriage didn't work out, I think the fact that she finally met somebody who treated her like a human being yeah. <laughs> was a good ending to the book, you know, because it's like, just because the marriage doesn't work out doesn't mean that, you know. Well, and they were together for, you know. Not forever, but for quite a few years, they were together from 77 to 91. So Yeah, that's a real good run. 
It's better than Meatloaf and his wife, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Um, I like that she ends this book or ends the epilogue with Bruce Springsteen lyrics from <laughs> Dancing in the Dark. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't, with the obvious caveat that I, as I've proven, barely remember the book, um, I don't think there was anything else in particular that I wanted to talk about. Did we miss any good, like, stories or whatever? Not that I can think of. Her son apparently makes video games. I saw that. Yeah, I wanted to see he is at least at the time that this was written, currently a game writer at video game developer Platinum Games. Oh, Platinum does Bayonetta. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Maybe he wrote Bayonetta. <laughs> Who knows? Um, <clears throat> Bayonetta is English, so maybe they they had uh, Michael DeBar's kid as an English person consultant. He, yeah. <laughs> I, he just wrote about Cl- Klonoa on uh, September 16th. I think it's this like Klonoa like pack or something. Oh, cool. This is the good news. I got one. The bad little bitches 10 buying marked it up double. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to like it. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that Nick DeVar and and I both um, share a love of Klonoa apparently. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I, I guess what I would say is this was another book that I, I came away from it again, still feeling (laughs) <laughs> positively disposed to the person who wrote it. I like you, you said you've been watching her YouTube and uh, listening to her podcast or, or at least like are interested in listening to her podcast. I she has a bunch more books and I'm like, I restarted my Audible subscription so I could get this. And I was like, you know what? If I might listen to her other books. Like, yeah, I'm interested in hearing I, the rest of. I, I want to. Yeah, I want to watch the one or listen or. Oh, my God. Read or listen <laughs> to the one that follows this. I just got a library card, so I might actually borrow that from the library. Yeah, because you can she's... borrow audio and digital books. This is an ad for your local library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she did. She did a follow up uh, memoir that is specifically about her marriage. Um, and then I think divorce and that one is called take another little piece of my heart. A groupie grows up and then she's done a couple of other, just like more general, like she did a book called rock bottom, dark moments in music Babylon, which I think, so another thing that I will, you kind of touched upon earlier, Kelly, um, Pamela DeBar is a really good self promoter. <laughs> uh, so like every one of the afterwards is like she slides in a, you know, cause she's, there's a new edition of this book, but it's like, and I'm also working on this other book. So like pretty much everyone you learn about what, what else she's written. So she, yeah. she talks about rock bottom. She talked about this other book called let's spend the night together backstage secrets of rock muses and super groupies. And that's like, she does profiles. It's like a, like a profiles in courage for groupies basically. So that one sounds super interesting. Um, and then she's even written, she's written a book recently about how to write a memoir. So um, definitely, I feel like this is our most prolific. If you don't count David Ritz, this is our most prolific author in the Headbangers book yeah. club for sure. And I'm, I'm like totally interested in, um, reading her other books, which is a shame. Cause I wish meatloaf had written more. I know <laughs> we were really, we were really robbed of a, of a great literary voice. Uh, yeah. when, when meatloaf <laughs> left this mortal coil, <laughs> speaking of reading more books, I, don't know what book we're going to read next. I'm going to throw this out here. We've gotten a lot of recommendations from people. Mm. Maybe we should pick one of those. Yeah, uh, that's probably a good idea. I'm not. But reading, I don't. I'm not reading another fucking Led Zeppelin book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm we not. can rule if if that was on the list, we can rule that one out. But uh, yeah, I know that we've got a lot of recommendations. So what I'll do is I'll I'll look at the recommendations again, and um, we can pick one that we like, and we'll put it out on on social media or whatever, and let you guys know what we're going to do. I don't know exactly when that's going to be. It might not be in October because I'm getting married this weekend and then we'll be on our honeymoon for a week. And then that puts us already in like mid October. And I so, will be playing. Ubits. I know. So like equal, <laughs> equal weight of, of, of life events. And you'll also be attending my wedding. So yeah, I'll be uh, attending your wedding. I have a bunch of cons coming up. Yeah. Cause my job, 
makes me go to cons and uh mm. well it doesn't make me well yeah. I, it does but i want to go <laughs> and i will be playing video games so yeah um, um, you know real real busy schedule <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can do a non-headbangers book club podcast just for the hell of it maybe we can do one of our one of our classic yeah. um i have actually I, i've been thinking i would like to because we always talk about we always get on headbangers book club and talk about the things that we've been doing instead of reading the books I think we could turn that into a podcast and do just like a what video games are you playing kind of a conversation. Okay. Um, we could try I, it. No one, no one will listen, but yeah, exactly. We do it. So yeah, we, we might do a, a, a rare non headbangers book club podcast next month and then come back. Maybe November will be the next book. I don't know. We'll see, but uh, you can find out what we're doing next by following us on our various social media outlets. Uh, we're at headbangers bc on twitter and instagram we're also at dystopian tweets on twitter and dystopian gram on instagram basically anything we say on one gets retweeted by the other account so you know take your pick uh you're probably listening to this on youtube but if you're not we're on youtube uh if you are listening to this on youtube consider listening to us on something else (laughs) uh i'm I'm not going to tell you how to live your life uh, I'm just saying that I personally prefer to listen to podcasts on not YouTube. So, yeah. you know, and if you're listening to this on something other than YouTube, like an, like an Apple podcast or whatever, leave us a review. I did my whole spiel last time. Your, your negative and positive reviews are equally welcome. If it makes me laugh, whether it's negative or positive, I will read it on the podcast and I'll send you a sticker. Yeah, we have two ratings and they're both five stars, so I can pretty much guarantee those are both us. Yeah, so if you want so, to knock us knock us down a notch, yeah, uh, right now we're sitting at sitting pretty at five stars. Yeah, some you of can y'all would us. disagree with that. So <laughs> come on. Uh, all right, thanks for listening. We'll we'll see you soon.